Thank you, Joseph. Abu Nawaz and Bint Sheikh. I should start by telling you why I chose this title before your imaginations wander here and there. I'm sure that everyone who knows Abu Nawaz has a big smile on their face. Let me introduce him to those who haven't heard of him before so, they, so that they can smile too. The first time I heard the Arabic word of diversity was during a discussion about Abu Nawaz an 8th century Arab poet from Basra in Iraq. A man some saw as a genius, others as a threat. To young adults like me, he was pretty funny. We had a neighbor in Beirut who loved to drink Arak, like Uzo and Pernod. When Arak is mixed with water, it turns milky white. Our neighbors would pretend to his wife and children that he was drinking a special kind of milk. We used to call this neighbor Abu Nawaz because of a story about the poet and his patron, the Caliph Harun al-Rashid. One day, the Caliph spotted Abu Nawaz drinking red wine early in the morning and took him to task for it. But commander of the faithful, the poet replied, what you see me drinking is only milk which has blushed in your royal presence. <laughs> but my ideas about Abu Nawaz acquired another dimension when I moved on to secondary school and we studied his poetry, where he was one of the first innovators in Abbasid period, often seen as the golden age of classical Arabic culture. In his poetry, he celebrated the love of wine, which has existed before Islam and remained common. The Quran banned it, but people consumed it, especially caliphs and their entourage in the Abbasid times. My mother now is in the grapevine, confessed the poet. Wine is the medicine for seduction. I remember learning his poetry by heart with amazing speed. One of his best known poems has attained almost proverbial, proverbial status and has found a place even in the discourse of illiterates, especially the, few, uh, the first few verses. صفراء لا تنزل الأحزان ساحتها لو مسها حجر مسته سرعه The nuts called me for it tempts me all the more cure me rather with yet another drink a pale wine that is a stranger to all sorrows that imparts joy even to the rock that touches it if I loved Abu Nawaz when I was an adolescent, it was because of his aura and his name. When I finally read most of his poems, I was enchanted. He expanded the range of Arabic poetry. But I wonder whether the full diversity of his work is as well known and admired as his poems on wine and erotic love. He did also write hunting poems and poems on polo, tigers, horses, and dogs, the desert and the city Baghdad, angels and devils, eulogies and elegies. His poems about young men were inspired by the era he lived in, when poets praised the charms of beardless youth. Some were students of religion, Muslim, Zoroastrians, or Christians. Others were drifters, porters, masseurs, even the Caliph Al-Amin, who some critics say is a character in this poem. I am in love, but cannot say with whom. I fear him who fears no one. When I think about my love for him, I feel for my head and wonder if it is still attached. With his usual cynicism, Abu Nawaz questioned strict social values and courageously managed to separate poetry 
from religion and morality. He broke with the tradition of melancholia and tragedy and in the instant in, and in the insistence in Arabic verse that enlightenment can be attained only through suffering. He believed instead that he and everyone else could attain salvation through pleasure. I sat before a boy as lean as a sword with the mirage desire flickering on his cheek and I formed a rank in prayer all to myself now if I cannot find an excuse for this on judgment day I should be in mourning already for wit and charisma Adonis the Syrian born poet and literary critic has written of Abu Nuwas he is the poet of sin because he is the poet of liberty as if sin were an existential necessity, a symbol of liberty, rebellion and salvation. When the gates of liberty close, sin becomes sacred. Abu Nuwas refuses to be content unless he practices and enjoys things that are prohibited. Sin provides Abu Nuwas with the comfort that he glorifies. He never appeared to fear punishment for being outspoken, either in his poems or in general, and he was imprisoned by two caliphs in succession. But one of them, Harun al-Rashid, loved the company of the poet, especially at night when they roamed the city together. Another book that I read at this stage in my life was an interesting and open-minded old Arabic text that had no uh, inhibitions or pretensions. It was the Sheikh recovers his youth by Ahmed bin Sulaiman, a 16th century writer. In 1968, when I was a journalist at an Nahar newspaper in Beirut, every morning that I went into the office, which I shared with four young male journalists, one of them would recite the book title and all four men would then collapse in laughter when I couldn't contain my anger and frustrations any, more, any longer. I asked the editor, what was going on? He explained that my colleagues were referring to Ahmed bin Sulaiman's book and that it was quite erotic. Al-Sheikh is of course also my family name so they were indirectly make fun of me. Can I find it in a bookstore? I would love to read it, I replied immediately. The book describes how our ancestors tried to regain their lost youth and libido with potions made from plants, insects, animals, and certain foods. Women have their own sections in the book as well. The bookshop owner who lent me the book, also urged me to read The Ring of the Dove by Ibn Hazm, which includes a story about a woman who thrills with joy at the death of her beloved because finally he won't be able to flirt with any other woman. <laughs> Ibn Hazm, an 11th century Andalusian writer and thinker, wrote 80,000 pages completing four bound manuscripts on history, philosophy, literature, religion, the art of speech, theology, astronomy, and love. His writings on love were based on first-hand experience, his own, his friends, and that of the female slaves and concubines who brought him up and taught him the secrets of the body and of desire. His book covered a wide variety of topics, the symptoms of love, falling in love while asleep, falling in love based on a description, falling in love after long association, on flirting with the eyes, love letters, betrayal, separation, wasting away from love, forgetting, and finally, death. I started poring over and enjoying these old texts which opened a door into a past that was not what we might expect 
a past that reflects diversity and contains a surprising choice of themes. Then I stumbled across the Andalusian poet, Wallada bint al-Mustakfi, the daughter of an 11th century Umayyad caliph of Andalusia, who set up a literary salon that became famous. One of her poems reads, I swear I am fit for noble things. I walk my walk and wander lost. I offer my lover my cheek to peck and give my own kiss to whoever desires it. Then I was stunned to read the 7th century poet al Khansa, who was famous for her candor and spontaneity when she recited a poem at the poetry festival at Aukaz. Another poet, al nabi Ghadubiani, interrupted her saying, go for it, you are more poetic than anyone else with breasts. <laughs> to which al Khansa replied, with my poetry, I surpass those who have testicles too. <laughs> Let me recall what a contemporary critic said about our Arab ancestors. They, they were more free to express their sexuality, while their descendants taste bitterness with the clerics of darkness. I agreed with him when I read The Perfumed Garden by the 15th century writer Muhammad al-Nafzawi, which discusses the importance of sex. When I was growing up, there were no newspapers lying around at home. Only my elder brother's school books and the Qur'ans with yellow pages. When I noticed that the book made my father tremble like a feather, I conceived the notion that books turn up among us in the same way as trees or cats. It didn't occur to me that they start out as an idea, which is then put on paper, bound and sold in bookstores. My favorite books were children's adventures books, such as Kalila wa Dimna, an 8th century Persian folk tale recounted by two jackals named Kalila and Dimna. This was the first book translated into Arabic from Persian, and it contains all the basic principles of life in the form of lessons to be learned, all presented through the voices of animals. I ended up obsessed by reading, from the names of shops to the leaflets that came with medicines. Things in the house made me, made me for images. The color and smell of shoe polish, a box of Turkish delight with its coating of icing sugar, the mothballs that marked winter when they fell apart and summer when they were full and drowned. Apart from still life in the house, my family and neighbors were the greatest stimulant. I was fascinated by the ways they communicated with each other. The silent dialogue expressed in their eyes, their sighs, their questions, the contradiction that put my senses on alert to see if they were lying, the tone of voice, the expression they used, my uncle, for example, if he thought someone unusually clever would say, you are smart enough to tailor knickers for a flea. <laughs> My favorite woman was a relative who lived in both Africa and Lebanon and been married twice. Her social status in her case based on wealth was tied in with her strength. She even felt superior to men. She took the women and children to the movies over the men's objections, learned to drive a car, and was independent. In contrast to her, there was another woman who came regularly from the South for medicine reasons. She spat whenever a visitor appeared wearing makeup or if she saw someone chewing gum. Gum, according to her, drew attention to a woman's mouth, which she considered to be an obscenity. But Adila, who lived opposite us, was the one I was most drawn to. One day, 
I had been begging the flock of pigeons that were going around in circles over the rooftops to take me away with them. Then I heard a voice imitating the cooing of pigeons. Hurry up and hold my wing. I am taking you away, it said. I giggled. The voice was Adila's, and she emerged from behind the sheets. She was hanging up. If you begged a cat and not the bloody pigeons, I would have mimicked the sound so well it would have made you pee in your pants. <laughs> I would spy on her in the evening from our balcony while she smoked her shisha pipe. When the water gurgled loudly, I wondered if she was upset and why. How come she lived alone and no one gossiped about her but found her intriguing with her witty comments. Why did she choose to sit in the dark by an open gate facing an empty alley when there was none of the daytime bustle for her to observe? Then one evening, at the age of 14, I found myself sitting apart from everyone else and writing. My father had allowed me and my elder sister to spend a whole week with our mother, who was spending the summer in the mountains with her new family. There I felt an urge to put down on paper a particular voice. I was in a steam-filled bathroom when I saw the branches of a tree almost touching the round, the, the round high window. I heard my mother's beautiful tender voice singing. I wanted to register the unusual feeling of beauty and warmth that overcame me. On other trips, I felt completely alienated whenever I left our house and its surroundings in Beirut. After reading a, new, a few lines from the book I Live by the Lebanese writer Layla Balbaki, I again felt totally removed from all what was around me. Although I was still in the heart of Beirut in the same old house, I found the book at the age of 16. I was heading to my father's store in Sursu, in the center of downtown Beirut, to deliver his lunch in a container. As usual, I had to pass a particular bookshop before <coughs> diving into the vegetables and fish markets. And one day, the bookshop window caught my attention. Layla Balbaki's book, I Live, was displayed in the window. I was drawn to her name because she had taught me for one year in elementary school. She had made a special impression on me by the way she walked and dressed. The title I live distracted me from the nose of the tram and the car horns and lifted me into the clouds. All I thought about was reading this book. I went into the bookshop, opened the first page and read. As I crossed the pavement between our house and the tram, I thought, who does the warm hair on my shoulders belong to? Isn't it mine? Just as every living creature has its own hair that it can do what it likes with, am I not free to take offense at this hair, which draws so much attention to itself that it seems more important than me? It wasn't like the other novels I had read before, works by Jubran Khalil Jubran, Mikhail Naimi, Maziyad Al Manfaluti, and Georgi Zaidan. I remember the end of I Live by Heart to this day, word for word. I went home as if forced to go home, she wrote. I always had to go home and sleep in that house eat in that house, bathe in that house, have my fate woven in that house. A few days later, I wrote an article in the form of reflections, not about my mother this time, but about being free, free, after my brother caught me sitting in a cafe and dragged me out by my arm and pulled me off home despite my resistance. I was imitating Layla Balbaki, who was famous for spending hours in outdoor cafes in Beirut. 
The next day, I headed to Al Nahar newspaper with the article in my hand, which was published on the youth page. The article caused a stir in our neighborhood. My brother was delighted and congratulated me, overlooking the fact he was the target of my criticism. <laughs> When I read I Live Again some years later, I understood why the book had shaken me to the core. I Live is often interpreted as a cry for individuality, a cry for justice from the forces of darkness and from man and God alike. Lena, the narrator, exposes the corruption and hypocrisy that arise in a society that is both matriarchal and patriarchal, unequal, and moralistic. She feels that individuals have to fight against a range of influences that seek to entrap them. Balbeck styles broke new ground and began a literary revolution in language, with short sentences flying like sparks in every direction, unusual imagery, and large doses of anger. She shared in the spirit of Beirut in the early 60s French literature and poetry were everywhere in the original language and in translation. Two magazines, Adab, which published fiction and share for poetry, were founded in 1950s to promote modernity. They published Arab writers and poets and Westerners in translation. I was drawn to these magazines like a magnet <clears throat> to titles such as The Flies by Jean-Paul Sartre, the Songs of Mehyar of Damascus by Adonis, The Severed Head by Unsil Hajj, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot and Jean Eyre, and Sound and Fury. I remember skimming through them in Arabic translation, thinking that I had found the door to a treasure, to a treasure trove. The more I read novels, especially by Egyptians, the more I wanted to fly off to Cairo. Didn't Layla Baalbaki live in Paris? Wasn't travel, after all, highest form of rebellion? I wanted to plunge into that experience, which I imagined to be exciting and frightening at the same time. In 1963, I was just 18 when I decided to pursue my education in Cairo, the mother of the world, as we called it. In order to prove to my father how serious and responsible I was, I decided to earn some money to pay for expensive. I thought I could win over newspapers, editors, and get a job interviewing Lebanese politicians about their first love. I managed to secure six interviews by playing tricks on the politicians, sold them to the newspapers, and hopped on a plane to Egypt. Soon, I was knocking on the office door of Ihsan Abdel Quddus, the prolific novelist and magazine editor, just like that, without ever having met him, to ask him if I could write some stories and have them published in one of his two magazines. He promised to do his best and published one short story, some reflections on love and betrayal. He introduced the article with these words. Girls in Lebanon are writing literature now. Thousands of girls of no more than 18 years of age are writing. The path of literature is very hard, but they have to, but, but they have the right to try. <laughs> Abdul Quddus had himself created a new genre of Arabic novel in the late 50s. After 1952 revolution in Egypt, education and literacy expanded rapidly, and writers could reach out to a new mass audience not just to intellectuals and the highly educated. Abdul Quddus was especially successful because he had women as protagonists in all his novels. And through these women's voices, he became a psychoanalyst to the nation, focusing on the hypocritical aspects of society. He was widely seen as a daring writer, but in fact, even he had his limits. When he wrote sex scenes, the text would trail off into a line of dots, <laughs> leaving the details to the reader's imagination. 
Once I asked him how he accepted the reader to guess what was happening, <laughs> giving that making love can take many forms. You have a point there, he said with a laugh. Maybe I should increase or decrease the number of dots. <laughs> <laughs> or make some big and some small, some round, some oval, and so on. As a Lebanese woman, I was often asked in Cairo if I was following in the footsteps of Zainab Fawaz, a 19th century poet who had roots in South Lebanon and moved to Cairo like me. She wrote a play called Love and Loyalty and a book called Rada the Flower which was milestone in the women's liberation movement of the time, rivaling the work of Qasim Amin, the modernist known for advocating women's emancipation in Egypt. When I shook my head, I was asked about another Lebanese woman, Labiba Hashim, who in 1906 set up a magazine called Fatat al-Sharq, the first woman magazine in the region. By lucky chance, I came across her novel, The Heart of the Man, just a few years before. She was 22 when she wrote the book, and at that time, there was no artifice. She wrote honestly and openly. Although the war was already history, Labi Bahashim wanted to portray the suffering that comes out of violence, conflicts instigated by men, have defined women's life throughout history, continue to do so, and may do so forever. My passion for writing began to take over my life when I was in my second year of college in Cairo. When I sat down to write, I found that at some point I distanced myself from everything I had read in Arabic and from all the writers, men and women. I had admired. I followed in the footsteps of Alberto Moravia in his novel Boredom, as in Arabic, which I read in Arabic translation. The narrator seemed to be whispering what he felt and thought into my ear. After reading him, I crossed out the first part of my novel I was writing, where a young woman called Dania was the narrator and rewrote it all with the man who fell in love with her as a narrator. I didn't want reviewers to describe me as a woman writer with only one story to tell or to treat my novel as purely autobiographical with the implication that women's writing should stay within walls. I was so paranoid about how the reviewers would react to a woman's literary voice that I thought that even with the male narrator, I would fail to deceive enough so I decided he had to be old, a 44-year-old married man with existentialist issues who fell in love with a 17-year-old girl who was striving to be a painter and lived with a great sense of originality. I went back to Beirut with the manuscript of my novel, Suicide of a Dead Man, after four years living in Cairo. The manuscript opened the way for me to become a journalist. I started looking for the unfamiliar to write about. I talked to a civil servant whose job it was to carry out executions by hanging, and a village woman with a goat that thought the woman was its mother. I interviewed the Russian poet Eugenie Yevtushenko and a young man who taught ordinary birds how to sing like canaries. I asked a nun who was the daughter of a well-known politician if she had chosen the monastic life because she didn't agree with her family's politics. In my second novel, The Praying Mantis, my narrator was a woman this time. I had none of the same inhibitions about being called a woman writer, writing an autobiographical novel. I was interested in the writing itself. I went too far. I made myself the center of my fiction, a fiction that drew its strength from seeming to be fact. The novel deals with a young woman who has to face unresolved religious orthodoxies and a strict upbringing that she believed she had already overcome. 
but which surface again. Between 1973 and 1975, I wrote a series of articles on Lebanese women who were well known and respected for what they had done in their society. They included politicians, pioneers in business, medicine, and law, artists, writers, actors, and the first Muslim Lebanese woman to take off the veil. Her name was Ambra Salam al-Khalidi, who was born in 1897. When Ambra opened the door to greet me with her dark brown and gray hair in a bun, I asked jokingly, where is your veil? In 1927, she had stood in front of a crowd with an uncovered face to speak at the Women's Renaissance Society. I had consulted first with my father, she said. I told him the veil obstructed my thoughts and stifled my feelings, stifled my feelings. I wanted people to see the, de 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 the determinations in my eyes. My father replied that taking off the veil was my own decision and that he would stand by me. When she made this gesture in public, it caused an outrage. Old woman wailed that the end of the world had come. Religious sheikhs said she and her family were destined to for hell. Posters condemning her went up on every street corner in Beirut. There were articles against unveiling in the newspaper some blamed her action on contact with other sects and with the West or on colonial influence, since Ambra had accompanied her father to Britain for two years from 1924 to 1926. The list of women I still wanted to interview was long, but when Beirut became a battlefield in 1975, with all the explosions and gunfire, I started wondering whether we would wake up alive the next day. I decided to escape with my two children, who were two and six months old. I wanted to be somewhere we could walk safely in the street without fear of car bombs or sniper's bullets, where we could press a switch and the lights could come on, where we could turn on the tap and hear running water, rather than having to stand in an endless queue in the street to fill jerry cans. Even food and baby formula were hard to find. But the real horror was the effect war had on the mind and soul, which left me shaking. But why did I choose London rather than anywhere else? Because I had visited London twice before and had fallen in love with it. I can't remember how I passed the time in London in those early days. I used to wait for the night when the television news came on. Even now, I shudder when I remember the theme tune for the news. I could see Lebanon going insane with insane inhabitants, and I felt totally paralyzed. I wondered why I had left Lebanon in the first place. Wasn't it because I didn't want to spend my life thinking about war? I decided that only writing would keep me sane and balanced. I knew that to understand what was going on and to deal with it, I had to write. My next novel, The Story of Zahra, was inspired by the violence of war. Zahra, the main character, faces two wars, the civil war in the real world around her and the private war in her childhood. When she supposedly went to the doctors with her mother, when, the, when in fact they were going to visit her mother's lover. The war provided me with a massive subject, reminding me of obvious question about life and death. The war put an end to my isolated existence as a novelist, and extended a bridge between me and others. It threw us all into a turmoil where we faced the same fate. Instead of picking up a rifle and fighting the politicians and warmongers, I picked up my pen and took revenge on them all when I wrote the story of Zahra. 
My husband's work took me from London to Saudi Arabia when I saw the desert in the days that followed, empty except for a few dry bushes against a backdrop of bridges, roads, and high walls, I noticed that there was no sign of women except the ones in black abayas moving, hurrying around, disappearing. I found myself among women like myself from other Arab countries or foreigners, being driven around in cars, not venturing to walk along in the streets. A collection of short stories, the desert roads grew in no time, and the seeds of a new novel, Women of Sand and Myrrh, were planted. They were growing by the second, and finally I understood the contradictions of the place in which I was living. The contradictions continued to haunt me. They became the heroine of the novel. Men controlled women, though they lacked curiosity about them, sexually, emotionally, and mentally. The men appeared to hold the power. A trivial decision such as whether to open a window required their approval. Sex was another area of contradictions. Men denied it or pretended to deny it, but their obsession with it, it was glaring, glaringly obvious. Sex was the great taboo, and yet it floated in the air everywhere. It could be triggered even by the sight of a box of sanitary, to sanitary towels on supermarket shelves. I was torn between rejecting the restrictions and welcoming them as a source of alienation. I saw myself living in two worlds, each feeding of the other. The more frustrated I was in the everyday world, the more inspired I became in the other world that was my writing. When I moved back to London in 1982, I very quickly took to the rhythm of English life, but my imagination refused to join me, stubbornly remaining in the Arab world. At that time, every day I sat down to write, I wondered to myself, how could I as a novelist survive without being inspired by my life in London? I would always come back to it from trips with my basket full like a fisherman who throws his net to the sea and then hurries back to shore to sort out his hole. By pure coincidence, my writing began to focus on London when I was asked to write a short story on Englishness from an outsider's perspective, followed by a commission to write two plays, Dark Afternoon Tea and Paper Husband. After writing these, I felt that the Atlantic wind had blown away all the clouds and showed me clearly that I was an Arab living in London and that I had volumes to say about subcultures and living in two worlds at the same time. When I decided to write a novel about Arab immigrants in London, I was one of them. I saw us all suspended between a past epitomized by a homeland that was lost forever, and a present that seemed like an illusion in which we tried to assimilate ourselves. Writing about this diaspora was like shifting between farce and heart-rending sadness. The flood of Arab immigrants into London continues for economic and political reasons. They come to save their skins or have a better life. Arab visitors also head to London for medical treatment, education, or summer vacations. I learned a lot about them by direct contact, whether in Earl's Court or Edgeware Road, and discovered that in their newly adopted country, these immigrants had recreated a version of the country they had left behind. There were groceries, estate agents, lawyers, and prostitutes catering for Arabs. In Edgeware Road or Little Arabia, as the taxi drivers call it nowadays, one meets all sorts of Arabs, among them myself, the novelist, who observed and weaved a novel called Only in London. 
Someone asked me, but you were a serious writer before you came and settled in London. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> but nothing happened. I had found humor in even the most restricted society, such as Saudi Arabia in 1980s. One irony was that even though men appear to have absolute power, power over women, the men were themselves weary of society's pressures and taboos. They found themselves balancing on a tightrope caught by the traditions and rules governing their own sexual lives. I therefore created a character who was so terrified of being caught with his American lover that he lost his wits and adopted the most bizarre disguises whenever he visited her. He became like the monkey that drank lemon juice and went mad. My novel Beirut Blues, which is also based on the Lebanese Civil War, mixed sadness and humor. It dealt with the way people strive to maintain a sense of continuity despite the ravages of war. Take, for example, the main character, Asmahan. While battles rage around her house, she and her family have a trivial obsession with the rat that has taken over the kitchen. If they want to go into the kitchen at night, they feel obliged to ask the rat's permission and sing to it. Come visit us, my beauty, come. When the servant announces that women are taking to the streets to, dem to demonstrate, Asmahan is too busy oiling her hair to join them. But when a stray rocket hits the house, she says to her grandmother, come on, let's cook it. Yes, of course, we laughed at painful things, always trying to find softer, lighter side in order to survive. This light heartedness in the novel strengthened the plot by asserting the importance of freedom. It had to be fought for and obtained at any cost. In my latest novel, The Occasional Virgin, I ended up restoring to absurdity because I never stopped being shocked when I came across stifling traditions instead of open-mindedness and progress in Arab societies, whether in the Arab world or in the diaspora. On attitudes toward virginity, for example, I wanted to write about this despair as satire, so I had Huda trick it, a strict young Muslim man, into thinking she was still a virgin. In a surreal plot, she wanted to take revenge on him for insulting her repeatedly at Speaker's Corner only because her hair was uncovered. I know now it is to live between two cultures, East and West, and between two languages, Arabic and English. These differences are still a constant source of fascination for me, holding me in suspense, in anticipation of the unknown. I remember when I read Stefan Zweig novels Beware of Pity in Arabic translation, I thought the, I saw the protagonist was a cat, and I was surprised to read that the cat opened the fridge and took out a bottle of water. That was until our neighbor, Ali Dirani, who lent me the book, told me that the translator should have translated the man's German title, Her, as Mr., <laughs> instead of translating it <laughs> as a her, a cat. <laughs> Ali, a political activist who was mad about reading, was a helpful guide. I would see him when he came back from work as a tram driver, sitting in his garden every afternoon, close to the fountain, oblivious to the, to the trickling of the water and to the wasps and bees that hovered around it, reading on and on, and sometimes letting out a sigh of admiration or a gasp of sadness or anguish. But when I moved to London to live between two languages, I rediscovered the magic of Arabic. 
though I did see the odd gray hair appeared on the head of my translator as she wrestled with sentences such as, قلبي صار يضرب كأنه لابس إبقاب. My heart started to throb as if it is wearing clogs. مشان إجرين الله حلي عني. Oh, for the sake of God's two legs, leave me alone. <laughs> I love the emotional charge of Arabic. It is so dramatic and theatrical, both in its written and spoken form. Listen to these two lines from the pre-Islamic poet Imra al-Qais. Mikarrin, mifarrin, mukbalin, mudabbirin, ma'an. Wheeling, retreating, chasing, withdrawing, like a rock boulder that the torrent hurls from on high. The two lines produce precisely the sound of galloping horse, tak, tak, tak. Arabic, with its rhythm and music, cannot but affect the listener, whether it is delicate or rough, loud or soft ugly or beautiful. I imagine the lines of the poem on the page. A feast for the eyes, whether written in ordinary script or fine calligraphy. Each word, a wellspring of images, a tree swaying in the wind, a sailing boat, a stream, a crescent moon, a long sleepy eyelash. When my novel started to be translated into other languages, I felt that the English translation, in particular, had fixed my feet to London, and they no longer swayed, hovered between staying and leaving. I was happy that I could take foreign readers to Lebanon and the Arab world for them to smell and see and hear and touch the unknown, if only for a short time, living between English and Arabic and reading the literature of the two languages is bound to have influenced me. It has added to and expanded my horizon. Sometimes I hear people asking me why I don't try writing in English, and I reply, because I dream in Arabic, because of the Arabic language is like one of my arm, and I cannot live without. I will always remember how I first fell in love with Arabic as a young girl, it was when I saw a sign above a shop selling heaters and lighting accessories, and nar when noor, fire and light. I would sneak out of the house as a child of just eight and make my way to the shop to gaze at these words that sparked my imagination. When I hear or read that I'm a British citizen, of Lebanese origin, or that I am a Lebanese living in England, I wonder where I really live. But the truth is that I live wherever my pen and papers are. I don't see living abroad as living in exile, because I'm not exiled from my language. I feel I'm interested in what's around me, whether I'm in England or anywhere else. I believe there is no one truth but every place has its own truth. A place of exile can be in one's own country, as Abu Hayyan al-Tawhidi, the Arab philosopher, said in the 10th century. Homesickness does not come to an end because it does not stem from exile, but rather from one's home country. And in Kalila wa Dimna, when the turtle hears the rat complaining that it doesn't want to leave its hole, but must because it was discovered. The turtle says, don't make too much of being away from home. Sensible creatures don't feel homesick or lonely. They go abroad only when they understand enough about life and have learned to be honorable. Many writers have spoken about this feeling before me, but I will add that in the past it was an ordeal for writers to move away from places where what they said provoked either debate or instant approval. 
Yet again, why the title Abu Nawas and Bint al-Sheikh, the Sheikh's daughter? My friend who published children's books helped me self-publish the story of Zahra. After I'd, I had taken the manuscript to around nine publishing houses in Beirut, all to no avail. And the reason? Because it was too risque and somewhat erotic. Two publishers rejected it for political reasons because the main character, Zahra, was against the war, not against one particular side. Zahra portrayed her brother, a fighter, as a thief who took drugs. When it was published, it was banned in several Arab countries. And when it was translated into other languages, the question started to arise. How did it come about that an Arab woman, a writer, could be so daring and write explicitly about sex and things that are hidden and secret? I won't deny that I was happy with the attention that surrounded me and the novel. But with passing of the years and with the accumulation of experience and self-confidence as a writer, and because I prefer to be honest, I have started to tell anyone who asks that I walk in the footsteps of my forefathers. Your forefathers? I mean the early Arabs, not my forefathers who plowed the land in South Lebanon. My forefathers like Abu Nawas. Even my contemporaries followed in the footsteps of our forefathers, like for instance, the Sudanese writer Atayib Saleh in his extraordinary novel season of migration to the north. Bint Mahjoub, one of the women in the novel, sat in the man's area, spoke to them with confidence about sex, swore like them, blew cigarettes, smoked like them, and even drank alcohol like them, and yet she was a pious believer who asked God for forgiveness. Atayib Saleh came to writing from an intellectual background and was well aware that the erotic in writing and in conversation was not alien to the Arab tradition. The explicit language in that text was central to the subject and fully harmony with spirit of the novel. So can writers write what they want? Did Arabic novels in the mid 60s tell the truth without evasion, tell the truth about sex and society without being banned. Safina Hanan il al Qamar, Sympathy's Spaceship to the Moon, was impounded in 1964. Season of migrations to the north was banned in Kuwait and other countries and could not be taught in Sudan on the grounds that it contained words and expressions that offended public morals. Has this changed after all these years? Will it ever? Finally, let me tell you about the second part of the title of my lecture, Bint al-Sheikh, which means in Arabic, the daughter of a sheikh That's me. <laughs> my father wasn't a man of religion, but he was pious. He was also open-minded and left me free to choose what I wanted despite his attempts to persuade me to cover my hair with a scarf, pray, and fast during Ramadan. Many years ago, when I was 17, a male friend gave me a lift to the beginning of the lane that led to our house. I was happy I had managed to stay out late with him. I had the house key in my pocket, so I wouldn't have to knock and my father wouldn't notice. I was coming home late. As I lingered in the car, I heard a voice calling out, come on, bint sheikh get out of the car. <laughs> it was the shopkeeper, whose bedroom was right above his shop. bint sheikh come on, yalla, get out of the car. Remember, you are the daughter of a pious sheikh, a devout believer. This shopkeeper felt he was like a father to me. The same goes for the barber and the man who sold falafel. <laughs> and like my father, the religious beliefs 
were gentle and compassionate. They never stopped me from becoming what I wanted to be. They only inspired me. I imagine my father and these men crossing the streets with me here in London and walking beside us. I imagine my mother and the women like my relatives who took us to the cinema and our neighbor Adila and the 10-year-old Yemeni girl I saw wandering in the valleys and hills of Kaukaban, trying to catch a snake so that on her wedding night, she could scare the man who was going to be her husband. <laughs> I imagine them all, foreigners in London, admiring this new world, reminiscing about home, sharing their worries, and having some laughs. I found myself thanking them for all the stories they inspired me to write. And I would like to thank you too for reading them. Thank you. Thank you.